behaviors, okay? So regular tax liability is sort of a policy-driven tax calculation. Now the AMT was really designed um, to take look of more of a closer look at our true economic income. They're taxing us more on the economics of what we've walked away with at the end of the year, as opposed to our policy-driven income tax under the regular tax liability. Um, so when it comes to the AMT, right, we're starting to pull back in what were originally tax exempt forms of income. Now we're starting to pull them back into the AMT calculation, okay? Various paper deductions that they let us have when calculating our regular tax liability, they're now taking away from us, right? Like if you took the standard deduction, well, you can't have it, so now you need to add it back. If you took uh, personal exemptions, they're taking them away from us under the AMT. Okay, and then we talked about various other changes that we have to make, adjustments that we have to make. Um, so we talked about the fact that taxes, okay, we were originally given a deduction for state, local, foreign income taxes. We were originally given deductions for real estate taxes, for personal property taxes on the fair market value of an asset, okay. They take all those away from us under the AMT. They pull them back. Okay, home equity. It's a maybe, you have to look closer at it, right? If you take the home equity out and you use it to improve uh, your home, to purchase and improve your home, then you can keep it under the AMT. You don't have to make an adjustment. But if you take that home equity out and you use it to buy a car or buy some furniture or just consolidate some credit card debt, guys, then for AMT, you do have to make an adjustment. You're not, you're not allowed to have it in that particular situation, okay? We also talked about the fact that if you're over 65, for regular tax purposes, a 65-year-old uh, or a higher taxpayer is allowed to use a 7.5% floor, right? But we said for AMT purposes, not allowed. He has to use a 10% floor. We went through all of these deductions the other day. This is just a quick sort of review. Okay, guys? So then our formula for AMT, we said our starting point is our regular taxable income. So you have to complete your form 1040 before you can calculate the AMT because we're going to figure a uh, piggyback off of the taxable income that we calculate off of our 1040. That's our starting point. Okay. Then we go through and we make these mostly plus adjustments. Right. The idea is to drive up the base. So we're going to have mostly plus adjustments and a few possibly minus adjustments here and there. Okay. This brings us to our alternative minimum taxable income. Okay. This is our new starting point. And then they give us an exemption. And the idea behind the exemption is to shield lower earning taxpayers from the AMT. Okay, that's the idea behind this. And we'll go, go through how to calculate this because it says that they give us an exemption amount based on our filing status. But they say if your AMT goes over these amounts, then they start to pull back the exemption by 25, 25 cents for each dollar you exceed the threshold. Okay, we'll calculate it. Um, that, once you take off your exemption, you have now your AMT base. This is where you're gonna calculate the tax, okay? The general rule is that it's a 26% tax up to, I think this year's rate is uh, up to 1,500. Um, anything over that amount gets taxed at 28%. Guys, though, still, st same long-term capital gain qualified dividend rules apply even at AMT, okay? So if you have long-term capital gains, you have qualified dividends, they still get those 0, 15, 20% rates. That doesn't change under IMT. Um, this brings you to what's called the tentative minimum tax. And they're calling it tentative because it doesn't mean, if you come up with some number here, that you automatically owe a tax. You don't. Now, you have to compare whatever you calculated, go back to your regular tax liability off of your 1040, okay? If the TMT is bigger than your regular tax liability, the difference is the AMT tax. If your regular tax liability is bigger than this TMT, you don't owe the AMT. You don't have to pay it. So that's why this is called tentative because you're not done yet. You're not 100% sure you owe it until you compare it to the regular tax liability. Okay? Questions, guys? Can you say that again about if it's greater than the Yes. So if you get, you're going to calculate this tentative minimum tax, and then the idea is you don't necessarily owe it right away, Jared. Um, you have to go now and compare it to your regular tax liability. 
If the TMT exceeds the regular tax liability, the difference between the two is your AMT. That's your AMT tax in addition to your tax liability, your regular tax liability, okay? If your regular tax liability is bigger than this TMT number, you have no AMT, okay? All right, guys, one of the hardest parts, there's two hard parts about the AMT. It's understanding the adjustments you have to make, okay? That's the tricky part, and it seems to be working in reverse. I mean, people want to subtract where they should add and add where they subtract. Um, so spend a little time looking at those adjustments. There's a bunch of problems in the book that you can sort of work through, and we'll go through a couple right now, okay? And then just remembering the formula, okay? I will, on the exam, provide, of course, you know, this sort of information, okay, guys? But again, the formula is on you guys to remember, okay? Um, so the two hard parts, again, are remembering the adjustments that need to be made and, you know, figuring out the formula, okay? Um, let's walk through two examples. Uh, let's look at number 58 first, and we'll do it on the board. Um, in 2015, Nadia has $100,000 of regular taxable income. Okay, guys, that is our starting point for our AMT calculation, the $100,000. She itemizes her deductions as follows. She has real property taxes of $1,500. She has state income taxes of $2,000. She has mortgage interest expense of $10,000, not a home equity loan. Uh, in addition, she receives tax exempt interest of $1,000 from a municipal bond issued in 2006 that was used to fund a new business building for a formerly out of state employer. Guys, I'm not going to be that vague, okay? I'm going to call it a private activity bond, or I'm not, okay? It's going to say municipal bond, then it truly is a municipal bond, and you don't have to worry yourself about it. If it says private activity bond, Okay, then you just learned you need to add it back for AMT purposes. I'm not gonna make you guys figure out whether or not it qualifies as a private activity bond. Um, and finally, she receives a state tax refund of $300 from the prior year. Um, what is her AMTI this year? If she deducted $15,000 of itemized deductions last year. So we have number 58, and we're looking at part A. With the single taxpayer, Okay, and her regular taxable income is $100,000. Okay, before we even get into all the deductions, guys, what's the first thing you want to do here? Sorry. Nope. Exactly. Don't go any further, guys. This is where everyone misses, okay? First, go back and add back her personal exemption. If she's married, give her back two personal exemptions, okay? So before you do anything else, none of these problems give you this information. It's, they're expecting you to remember it, okay? First thing you're looking at is did they take a standard deduction and did they get exemptions? If they did, you've got to bring them back in, okay? So, good. Okay, so then we want to look and see what were her deductions, okay? Real property taxes of $1,500. Do we need to make an adjustment? Yes. Yes. Do we need to add it back? Yes. Um, we have $2,000 of state income taxes. Do we need an adjustment? Yes. Yeah. She has $10,000 of uh, mortgage interest, not home equity loan next. Do we need an adjustment? No. No. We don't need an adjustment. I thought I heard a yes. But was it you? Um, no, we don't. Okay, mortgage interest, guys, is good for AMT. If it's regular acquisition debt, mortgage interest, you do not need an adjustment. It's only the home equity component, right? And you only make an adjustment for the home equity component if you don't use it to improve or purchase the home. Again, if you use it to buy other stuff, do other stuff with it, then it's an adjustment back. Okay, so we're gonna just ignore that $10,000. In addition, she receives tax exempt interest of $1,000. Guys, this is a private activity bond, okay? We're gonna add it back, right? Plus $1,000. And they also tell us that she receives a state tax refund of $300 from the private year. Do we need to do anything with that? Yes. Yes, what do we need to do with it? We need to subtract it. 
Yeah, because she took itemized deductions last year, right guys? This goes with sort of our tax benefit rule, okay? She took a big deduction last year under itemized deductions. She got a refund this year. Um, and because they're not allowing us to deduct our income taxes under AMTI, well, they can't tax on that gross income, so we're going to reverse it out. We're basically pulling it out of AMTI, right? Um, so here, her AMTI would become 108200 okay? Part B has all the same sort of exemptions, uh, but it says, what is Nadia's AMTI this year if she deducted the standard deduction last year? Okay, does that change anything we did here? She took the standard deduction last year. Well, that was last year, though. You're kind of confusing a little bit. She didn't take it this year, she took it last year. All right, guys, what they're saying is don't forget, we get this $300 refund, we only report that when we take a standard, uh, sorry, when we took itemized deductions, okay? You only would get this refund when you itemize. But you wouldn't get a refund ever from taking a standard deduction. This is part of our tax benefit rule. I won't be that technical. As long as you guys remember that, look, if she itemized and she has to reverse her state income taxes, she therefore this year would have to reverse any gross income, okay? But under the tax benefit rule, if she took the standard deduction, she would never have this this year. for a similar one. Uh, number 59, he is spend, he's single, and he has $120,000 of regular taxable income. He itemizes his deductions as follows. He has real property taxes of $2,000, he has state income taxes of $4,000, his mortgage interest expense of $15,000, not a home equity loan, even. Um, he also paid $2,000 in tax prep fees and has positive AMT depreciation adjustments of $500. What's his AMTI? So again, we have a single taxpayer. He has regular taxable income of $120,000. First thing we're going to do. Add back. Add back his exemption. Okay. He's gonna get plus four thousand dollars for his personal exemption. Okay. What about his real property taxes? Add them back. We're gonna add back the two thousand dollars. What about his mortgage? Uh, sorry. Uh, what the heck is this? Oh, state income taxes of four thousand dollars. Gonna add them back. What about his mortgage interest of fifteen? Leave it alone. Leave it alone. Um, what about his tax prep fees, guys? You're going to make an adjustment? No. No. Why not? It's two thousand dollars of tax prep fees. Is it already taken out as taxable income? No. It's, it's yeah. because they want you to do the calculation, right? Tax prep fees, guys, get the two percent floor. Right, they're subject to the two percent floor. Well, his taxable income, guys, is one twenty. Technically, we use his um, AGI, but we have to assume his AGI is something higher than one twenty. Okay, maybe one thirty. We don't know exactly, but even if we use this number, okay, one hundred and twenty thousand dollars times two percent is twenty four hundred dollars. That would be the floor. So nothing would make it over the floor. So he didn't take a deduction. Okay, um, so we wouldn't have to do anything for those miscellaneous in this case. If his floor, let's just go through this. Let's just say his floor was, forget that, um, $1,500, okay? Let's just say we calculated a floor of $1,500 versus his $2,000 miscellaneous expense, okay? Then he would have taken a deduction of $500 on his itemized and his Schedule I, right? If he had a $1,500 floor and he had $2,000 of tax prep fees, he would have taken a $500 deduction, yes. Um, for these purposes, the rules would say we would reverse that out, okay? We would have to bring it back in. Um, we would add it back, actually. Um, but we don't have to do that here. 
we would bring back $500 plus $500. Okay, that would be one of our adjustments. Only the portion of the miscellaneous 2% that make it over the floor, only the portion that go over the floor are in add back, not the entire amount. Um, okay, and then they tell us the depreciation, guys, again, we didn't go through depreciation, so I won't hold you accountable for that. So here, his AMTI would be one, uh, 130500 Okay. Uh, can you go over why we don't add the mortgage in this expense? Um, there's two mortgage, uh, I should say, uh, home interest deductions. We have our mortgage or acquisition debt interest, and then we separately have home equity. Mortgage interest is okay under AMTI. They don't, that's not an adjustment. Home equity is potentially adjustment, okay? If you take the home equity out and you don't use it to buy or maintain or improve the home, okay, then you would have to add it back. If you take a home equity out though and you use it to purchase or improve the home, then you don't have to make an adjustment for that either. But mortgage interest itself is never gonna be an add back, okay? Only potentially the home equity. Okay. For the depreciation, Professor, we, we would only subtract it if we knew that exceeded the regular tax depreciation. Yeah, we haven't so studied assuming. depreciation, so I'm not going to hold you guys accountable for it. Look, I mean, the fact is, is when we get to depreciation, guys, there's 200% um, and 150% methods that accelerate depreciation. Um, okay, but for AMT purposes, they only allow you to use 150 or straight line. So they basically are making you pull back. So there's timing adjustments that would need to be made. But again, because we didn't cover depreciation, I'm not gonna hold you guys to okay. Okay, um, let's do a different one where we sort of pull the whole formula together. Let's look at um, number 64. Uh, yeah. 64. We have Janet and Ray, they're married, finally joined. They have five dependent children under 18 years of age. Janet and Ray's taxable income is 140. They itemize their deductions as follows. Um, they have real property taxes of $5,000. They have state income taxes of nine. Mortgage interest expense of 15. Uh, that's everything. That's everything, okay? And they wanna know what their AMT is. So. 64. So we have two taxpayers, they're married, filing joint, and they start by telling us their regular taxable income is $140,000. Okay? First thing we're going to do. Okay, how much are we going to add back? $28,000, right? They have five kids plus themselves is two more, seven times four, $28,000. So um, we're going to add back their exemption. You wouldn't have to figure out the phase out. Mm -hmm. If they made enough money, you would. <laughs> I mean, in a real problem. Yeah. Um, and then the rule says if they were phased out and instead of taking $28,000, let's say they got $20,000, you would only add back 20. You wouldn't add back 28. Um, so I wouldn't make it that real big. Real um, so, but yeah, I mean, if they're technically, if their taxable income, you know, exceeded the threshold, which I think for that is like three hundred and three thousand dollars or something like that. Then yes, yes. Um, okay, guys. So we have AMTI of one eighty-two Our next step says we have to figure out our exemption. Okay, they are married, filing joint with an AMTI of one eighty-two. They exceed our threshold. Okay, which means they're not entitled to the full eighty-three thousand four hundred dollar exemption under 2015 rules. Um, and the rules as 
by each dollar their AMCI exceeds the threshold, okay, we pull back on this exemption, 25 cents per dollar, okay? So the way to do this, take your 182, minus your threshold, which should give you 23,100, okay? That's your difference. Multiply it by 0.25, or divide it by four, what have you. 5775. This is the amount that we reduce the exemption by. Okay? We take the AMCI, because it's more than our threshold, right? The AMCI that we calculated is higher than the threshold. And when that happens, guys, they're not entitled to the full exemption. The exemption starts to get reduced. For each dollar you go over the threshold, the exemption reduces by 25 cents per dollar. Okay? So take your AMCI that you calculate minus the threshold, come up with the difference. So they went over by $23,100. For each dollar they go over, the exemption decreases by a quarter. So divide by four, multiply times 0.25, whichever you want to do, is 5775. That means our original 83,400 exemption, we take 5775 off. So our exemption becomes where is it? 77625. That's 77625. Sorry, my handwriting is not So going back over here, we're going to take off our exemption. And we've now got an AMT base of 104,375. Okay, we're at 104,375. We then apply our tax rates, okay? Our tax rates, guys, are 26% on the first, is it 185,400, okay? This year it's 185,400, and I will give you the rates on the exam. I'll give you 185,400, 26%, and anything they're over is 28%. Okay, guys, but no, also, again, you always have to go back in and check, do I have a preferred form of income? Because those preferred forms of income still get the zero, 15, 20% rate, so don't forget those rules too, okay? But since our 104.375 is under the 185.400 threshold for 26% taxing, it's all gonna be taxed at 26%, which gives us 2713750. Okay, so this is our TMT. This does not mean it's our tax. We're not just going to run and pay this, okay? Wait, how did you figure out to multiply by 26%? There's a rule that says for the AMT, there's really two tax rates in effect, okay? Yeah. Everything up to $185,400 this year gets taxed at 26% flat. If you go over $185,400, any amount that goes over that is now taxed at 28%. It's two rates unless there's preferred forms of income, right? Those keep that 0, 15, 20. You say you're giving us those numbers on the exam? I will absolutely give you those numbers on the exam, yes. And I will give you, again, I will give you this as well, okay? Um, so our TMT is 27,130, guys. In the problem, they tell us that their regular tax liability is 26,587, okay? That's their regular tax liability. So because their TMT is more than their regular tax liability, they do, in fact, owe the AMT. They owe another $550.
So for the um, for the uh, AMC exemptions, right? Yes. The threshold is one fifty eight nine hundred. Does that mean that if your income is below that amount, you get the full eighty three four hundred? Yes. Okay. Yes. Because the idea behind the exemption for the AMT is that lower earning taxpayers, they don't want to have, to have them face this tax. Um, so they're giving them a nice hefty um, check that their income is gonna be protected by these exemptions. Okay. So yes, if you fall below, you're entitled to the full amount. Once you go over that amount though, they start taking away that deduction by one quarter for every dollar you go over, okay? Guys, you're good with this? There's a lot of components here. Just understand the legals. Just take a little bit of time looking at the labels. You know, know what the AMTI is, know what the base is, know what the TMT is, okay? Understand what the AMT is. Okay. Good questions? Anything? Can you do the regular tax liability by using the tax Calculate it again. So, uh, for a problem, if it gives you a qualified dividend, can you just hold on to that? Yes, you would do it like you always tax your ordinary dollars first. So if this was, let's just say, a hundred thousand dollars of ordinary income and four three seven five of qualified dividends, you would tax a hundred thousand dollars using your twenty six percent, and then the other four three seven five. Now you would take our regular seven tier tables and convert them to that three tier table. This would probably fall into our mid range, so that four thousand three hundred and seventy five would get a fifteen percent rate. You would follow the same procedures we used when we did capital gains. Um, tax the ordinary first, the preferred second. Okay. And you said there's a certain threshold in which you get to uh, multiply the MT base by twenty six percent, and then after it gets past a certain number. Yeah, it's one. This year they changed it, which is why I can tell. Um, yes, it's 185400 this year. Okay, so anything up to this amount is taxed at 26%. If you go over this amount, any dollars that go over this get taxed at 28. Yeah. Two rates, 26 and 28. Good. Okay, guys, we are going to move on to the payroll slash self-employment taxes. I um, made a schedule up here. If you didn't get one at the beginning of class, you might want to grab one now. Tax guys, look, this is a tax that helps fund retirement. Um, 
you know, we are paying into this currently. There's big debate about whether or not this will exist when we are ready to collect on it. Um, we'll see what happens, I guess. But for the time being, this tax stands, and it's a 12.4% tax currently, and the current year cap is $118,500. So once you make up to $118,500, the tax stops, okay? Doesn't go over. And if you look at the reading in the book, guys, they make the point that if you're married filing joint, the 118.5 cap is on each taxpayer separately. So my, myself and then my husband are each responsible for this up to 118.500, okay? Now in an employee-employer relationship, the way it works is they're gonna withhold 6.2% from my paycheck and they're gonna file it for me. And the employer is gonna match the other half. It's his expense, the other 6.2%, and he will take it as a deduction on his books. He'll um, pay that when he pays mine over to the IRS. Um, so the maximum for each person uh, currently is $7,347. In the case of Medicare, guys, Medicare is to help fund uh, medical, okay? It helps fund medical system. And I've broken this into two taxes. I'm gonna call it M1 and M2, okay? Because the M2 is relatively new in the past couple of years. Now M1, guys, is the standard 2.9% tax, and it is on an unlimited amount of earnings. This tax does not stop, it keeps going. As much money as you make, they'll keep taxing it, okay? Employee-employer relationship, I have 1.45% uh, withheld from my pay by my employer. He matches the other 1.45, he takes it as a deduction. He does all the withholding and filing with the IRS, and really don't think too much about it, okay? The M2 tax, which is the newer of the taxes, guys, is a 0.9% tax, and this affects your higher earning taxpayers, okay? I gave you the filing statuses there. Um, if your earnings reach this level, now you are responsible for this extra 0.9% tax. Now look at the little note there, okay? If you're married filing joint, this is on your combined wages, so it's different than Social Security. Social Security, you have to look at each taxpayer separately. Here, you're gonna take the combined wages from both parties in determining whether or not they've met this level, okay? Guys, only the employee is responsible for this tax, okay? Only the employee. The employer is not gonna match this on his side. Now, there's notes in the book that also tell you guys that employers for this 0.9% tax are only required to start withholding at $200,000. So if you're married, uh, sorry, if you're single, this works out just fine for you because you make $200,000, they start withholding, that's your threshold, all is well with the world, okay? If you're married filing separate, however, your threshold is 125. They don't start withholding until you hit $200,000. Okay, you may be underpaying. They're under withholding you for by about seventy-five thousand dollars worth of income. Okay, once you hit one twenty-five, until you get to two hundred, they are not withholding that 09 percent tax. So when you file at the end of the year, you bet it's going to catch up with you, and you're going to have to pay that extra tax on that seventy-five thousand dollars at that time. Okay, so there's a scenario where you may be under withheld. On the flip side, if you look at the married filing joint. Okay, they may over withhold you because they're gonna start to withhold at $200,000. But the requirement for your threshold says they don't need to do that until you hit 250, okay? So you might actually, well, you will actually have a um, prepayment. You'll have a prepayment in that case because they're withholding too soon. Now I'm pointing out at the bottom of this tax because it may the book when I went about solving these problems one way, I'm gonna go about it a little differently. And I'm gonna kind of follow what this chart is doing and hopefully it'll help make sense of it more. Um, guys, just keep in mind, we've been talking about employee, employer, okay? But when you're self-employed, you are responsible for both halves of this tax. No one is out there to pay the other half for you or file it for you, okay? So you have to figure out both sides of the tax and you're gonna report it all, I believe it's line 57 on the 1040, there's a line on there that says self-employment taxes. So you're gonna report the full amount there, okay? Now, if you think back to the beginning of chapter six, okay, we said that 
uh, a self-employed taxpayer can deduct self-employment taxes, okay? What he can deduct is the employer column, okay? He can deduct that employer column. And we said because, guys, taxpayers who have trader business activities and they fill out the Schedule C, because in the eyes of the IRS they're not employees, they're not allowed to deduct expenses for themselves on that Schedule C. If they have employees, right, they could deduct the employee's health care insurance, they could deduct the employee's payroll taxes, but they can't make these deductions for themselves because they're not employees, okay? But to give them parity with the business, other forms of business who are allowed deductions, what they do is they tell you, okay, your health insurance, you could deduct it as a 4 AGI deduction, okay? And they provide the same thing in this way, okay? Because in a traditional employee-employer relationship, employers are usually match half the expense, 6.2, 1.45, and take deductions for that. They let you take the employer column deductions as a four AGI deduction uh, when you fill out your 1040. We'll go through this in examples, so hopefully it'll make more sense, okay? Um, let's look at a problem. Right now we're gonna just assume a traditional employee-employer relationship. Yes. It's a prepayment. Yeah, so if they start withholding you at 200 um, and you didn't need to be withheld till 250, you have a prepayment on your 1040. Does it count for its regular Yep. Yep. You'll see actually when we, um, well, if we could pull out the 1040. If you have a 1040, pull it out. There are, if you go to the payments section, should not even be in there. Uh, C, line 71, excess social security. Actually, that wouldn't even be social security, it's Medicare. Where the heck is this one at? They don't make it easy. Unreported. It does go on here as a prepayment. I have to, I'm pretty sure it's line 71, but I'll double, I'll double check on the line number. But yeah, I mean, basically, it's like you paid it more than you had to. You're always entitled, if you overpay, you're always entitled to your own money back as a credit towards your tax liability. So yes, it goes on here, and you would get it back off of your regular tax liabilities. Yes. Okay. I'll find the right number for you. Line number. Okay, guys, let's look at um, problem... 66. Uh, we have Brooke. She works for company A for all of 2015, earning a salary of $50,000. They want to know what is her FICA tax obligation for the year. She's working for a company, so she is only responsible for 6.2% of this. So if you take 6.2 times $50,000, it's $3,100, right? Then I would put M1 and M2, okay? The M1, guys, is the, she's responsible now for 1.45% on an unlimited amount of earnings. So 1.45% on $50,000 is $725, okay? She's not gonna be responsible for the M2 tax here, right, because she's single and she would have to reach $200,000 earnings before she had to pay that, so she's not gonna have to pay that expense. So here, in this scenario, her FICA tax obligations, guys, are $3,825, okay? Now keep in mind, she's an employee in this situation, guys. She's not gonna write a check for any of this. She's not gonna have to report any of this on her 1040. 
because this was all taken care of. This was withheld by her employer and they did the filing. So she's not gonna have to report any of this on her tax return, okay? This was really done for her. Um, but this is the allegation. This is what came out of her paycheck and what she owed for the year, okay? Can you just clarify again with um, if you're married filing separately with um, how you might owe the taxes, um, the M2 tax? Yes, so married filing separate says you're responsible for that tax once you reach $125,000 earnings, 0.9% on anything over 125. But the law says your employer is not required to start withholding until you reach $200,000 earnings. Okay. Um, so there's a period of $75,000 where your employer probably should be withholding, but he's not because he doesn't have to. Okay, so if you make $200,000 as married filing separate, from 125 to 200, they weren't withholding that 0.9% tax, but you owe it. Yeah. So when you file your 1040 at the end of the year, that's gonna be an extra tax you're gonna have to pay on that $75,000 that he didn't withhold for you. Okay. Okay. Uh, getting back to 66, uh, Part B says assume Brooke works for Company A for half of 2015, uh, earning fifty thousand uh, dollars, and she works for Company B for the second half of 2015, earning seventy thousand dollars. What is her FICA, ob uh, FICA tax obligation for the year? So this is going to stand. She did that for half the year. Now she's earning another seventy thousand dollars for the other half of the year. Okay, guys, you're gonna go through sort of the same gyrations, okay? Her employer is gonna say, okay, we need $70,000. 6.2% is her obligation. So 6.2 is 43.40, okay? Always, the 1.45 is always gonna apply on any level of earnings. So that's another 10, 15. And she didn't reach $200,000, she's saying off. So she's not responsible for the M2 tax. So, again, this is her employer, her second employer, when she quit this job and went over to this job, this is what they're gonna withhold, this is what they're gonna report for her, and they did the right thing, guys. And you might be tempted to just kind of add these up and say that was her obligation for the year. But we can't do that, right guys? Because in total, she earned $120,000, right? She went over the 118 cap. So in fact, she only owes 7347. She was over withheld, not because her employers did anything wrong, okay? They don't know what happened at your previous job. So she's gonna get this back as a prepayment, a credit, when she files her tax returns, okay? Because here, if you look at it, it was actually, um, it added up going this way to 74.40, okay? That's what she was withheld by, but the cap says she shouldn't pay any more than 73.47. So she was over withheld by $93, and she will take it as a credit back on the top. Okay? Here, guys, this is gonna be fine, because again, the 1.45% tax applies regardless of the level of income. Now, we also don't have to worry about the M2 because she's a single taxpayer and she didn't quite hit $200,000 of income. So this is still not gonna apply. But guys, keep in mind, if she earned you know, 125 at this job, 125 at this job, they wouldn't have withheld anything because she didn't hit those numbers. But combined, at the end of the year, she's gonna have to now file and pay if she went over, okay? Um, good. Okay. Let's look at 67. We have Rashid. He works for company A, earning $350,000 in salary during 2015. Assuming he has no other sources of income, what amount of FICA tax will he pay for the year? There's another single taxpayer. And he has earnings of $350,000, okay? So first, Social Security. Guys, he made a lot of money, okay? So he's gonna be capped at that 118500 
So his portion of the obligation is going to be 7347. His employer over here, we'll call this employee, and this employer is going to pay also 7347 on his behalf. Okay? Then his M1 expense. Well, again, guys, it's always going to be 1.45 because it's unlimited earnings. So he's going to have another 5075 of Medicare expenses. And so is his employer. Okay? They're going to match him with another 5075 Then we have the M2 expense. Okay? He does need to be worried about this. Okay, he's single, the threshold is $200,000. He went over that threshold by $150,000. So he does in fact fall prey to the extra 0.9% tax times the 150 excess earnings. So he has another 1350 that he's responsible for. Okay, and it works out nicely for him guys because he's single, his threshold is 200, and that's the point at which his employer is required to start withholding. So he doesn't have to worry about under or over withholdings here, okay? So his obligation is 13772. His employer paid guys 12329 but we don't care about this, right? This isn't his expense, okay? So we don't really care what it costs his employer. That's not our problem. His obligation is the 13772. And again, guys, here, he was an employee. This was all withheld from his check. He doesn't have to report any of this on his tax return because his employer is taking care of all of the accounting for him. There was no over or under withholding, so it's all good, okay? What happens, though, guys, if, let's just say, instead of single, he's married, filing separate, here you go, Jean. This might help you. Let's say he er uh, has the same $350,000 in earnings, but now he's married, filing separate. Okay. Well, the numbers are going to be the same. He's going to have the 7347. The employer is going to match him 7347. Uh, Social Security for M1. He's going to have the same. Okay. Now for M2, it's going to work out a little differently. Okay. He's now married, filing separate. His threshold drops to <coughs> 125. He made 350. So he exceeded the base by $225,000, okay? So it's going to be $225,000 times the extra 0.9%. His employer doesn't have to pay it, right? The employers aren't responsible for that extra tax. He has an obligation here of 1447. This is his FICA obligation. Guys, the problem is, His employer only started withholding at $200,000, okay? If you go back and look, his employer started withholding at $200,000. But his threshold is actually one twenty-five. dollars That's where he needs to start paying the tax at. So his employer only withheld $1,350, okay? So there's $675,000 here. Oh, sorry, $675. This is what his employer would have withheld using that $200,000 requirement of where they need to start withholding versus him being married, filing separate, needs to start paying at 125. So there's another $675 there that he's gonna have to file and pay on his own. So when he fills out his 1040, he's gonna have to report this as an extra tax. Okay, an extra tax owed. You guys following this portion? Okay. Okay, guys. So this is employee employer. It's fairly straightforward when you're an employee. Okay, for the most part, it's stuck with these weird sort of situations with this $200,000 required withholding. It's pretty neat, okay? For the most part, it's gonna come right out of your wages. It's not gonna require a lot of extra reporting on your part. It's all done for you. 
your employer pays the other half of the taxes, so you only have half the burden you normally would. The part where you're saying the employer only withholds to two hundred thousand only for the M two. The M two, yeah, yeah. That's the law. So they only have to start withholding for any employer. They don't care what the filing status is at two hundred thousand dollars. So because he's married filing separate, the rule says his threshold is one twenty five for that point nine percent tax. So there's seventy five thousand dollars in income where they're not taxing. So when he files his tax return at the end of the year, he needs to do it on his own. Okay guys, so now assuming you're self-employed, again, there's no one out there to pay this half of the tax, okay? You have to pay it, at least initially. Um, you also have to do all the filing, all the reporting. Okay, this is all on you because you don't have an employer doing this on your behalf. Um, so again, you would report the full amount. Okay, you would report the full amount on line 57 where it says self-employment taxes. And then you are allowed to take the employer portion as a four AGI deduction. Okay? Where's the... So this is in an employee employer situation, right? The employee pays half the tax, the employer pays half the other half the tax. Okay, with the exception of that extra 0.9% tax, only the employee is responsible for that. So instead of it being a 12.4% Social Security tax, it's split 6.2 and 6.2. For Medicare, it's a 2.9% tax technically, but it becomes 1.45 charged to the employee, the other 1.45 charged to the employer. He pays the other half, okay? Only this extra 0.9% tax, if you make a fair amount of money, is on the employee only. It's not split between the two, okay? Only the employee is responsible for that. So we don't necessarily care what it costs the employer, okay? That's not our problem. We really care what did it cost the taxpayer. Professor, I was doing the cap at 118500 That's because anybody who goes over, they should be able to, I'm assuming they just save their own money and for their own retirement, kind of? Um, well, I think it has more to do with the fact that there's only a certain amount of money you're going to get back at the end of the day. Okay. Um, the Social Security only pays out so far, so I think they stop taxing you at a certain rate because you're only going to give back at a certain rate. Okay. Okay. And it changes every year, right? Or that stays, that's been stay the same, that cap? No, it changes almost every year. This okay. has changed since last year. Last year it was 117. So yeah, because I think they just did that, like the cost, is it cost of living? They change it almost every year. Yeah. Certain okay. numbers they change, others they don't. This change was up by $1,500. Okay. So, uh, okay guys, so anyway, when you are self-employed guys, it becomes a little more complicated because again, now you do have to pay both halves of the tax, but because you can't take a deduction for this on your Schedule C, instead they give you a 4 AGI deduction for the employer portion of the taxes above the line. Okay, this is, if you go back again to the beginning of Chapter 6, we said we'll get there. Well, we're here now. Okay? <coughs> you are allowed to claim back as a 4 AGI deduction the employer portion of this tax. So, um, now, Guys, as a self-employed taxpayer, again, we're going back to the Schedule C, okay? You filled out your Schedule C, you have all your business revenues, you have all of your business expenses, okay? Except for expenses for yourself, you can't deduct your health insurance, you can't deduct your payroll taxes, okay? You can't deduct your pension costs, okay? Because you're not an employee. But if you have other employees, you can deduct all those expenses on the Schedule C for them, just not yourself. You have your revenue, you subtract your expenses, okay? You come up with a net profit number for your trader business, okay? And then I said, guys, you take that net profit number and it travels over to the gross income section of your tax return, right? Okay? The rule for this deduction says you take that net profit number, the number you would report as gross income, and you instantly multiply it times 0.9235. 0.9235. Three, five. Okay, so you take whatever your company's profit was and mark it down. Multiply it by 9235. Guys, I'm telling you right now, half of you will miss this on the exam. 
don't miss it. Don't miss it. You have someone with self-employment earnings. Take the profit of the company and multiply it by 0.9235 before you go one step further because your answer will be wrong from top to bottom. Okay. The reason they do this, guys, is because, look, if this was a traditional corporation, the traditional corporation is allowed to make this 6.2 and 1.45% deduction for their employees, okay? They take this as a deduction. So they are giving this self-employed person who isn't allowed to make these deductions an implicit deduction, okay? Before he has to calculate his payroll taxes. That is the purpose behind this. So what is it? 0.9235. So take the company's profit, okay? Take their profit, multiply it by 0.9235. The book calls it net earnings, guys. I don't care what you call it, just make sure you multiply it times 0.9235. I am begging you, because this kills me on an exam when I go to grade these, okay? And then you do all the taxes. And then we're gonna go through the calculations, okay? So, let's look at 68. Alice is self-employed. Guys, you're seeing self-employed, you're thinking 0.9235, okay? She is self-employed. Her net business profit on her Schedule C this year is 140, but you guys know it's not 140. You know it's something smaller than that, right? Um, what is her self-employment tax liability for 2015? So we have a single taxpayer, she's self-employed, okay? She has net profit on her Schedule C of 140. This is also her gross income from that company. I think it's line 12, okay guys? But you are not going to use that number. We're gonna take it, we're gonna multiply it times 0.9235, which is gonna give us 129. 290. That is the number we want. Again, I'm begging you. Okay? That's the number we're working with. Okay. That's her real net profit? This is her net earnings. This was her net profit. Okay? This is what she would have reported from her trader business activities as the profit. But we want to convert it into net earnings. That's this. This is what we use for calculating her payroll taxes, her self employment taxes. We only do this if she's an employee. Uh, sorry, self-employed. Okay. Then we're going to go through the same steps, guys. First, we're going to look at Social Security. Okay. Based on her net earnings of 129, 290. Okay. She went over the 118,500. Right. So she's capped. And we're going to break this into employee portion, and we're going to break break this into employer portion. So 7347. 7347, okay? Because she went over the 118,500 threshold, or the cap, I should say. Medicare one, okay? Guys, this one is pretty straightforward. Whatever her earnings are, it's times 1.45 and times 1.45. So here we've got 1874, 71. And the employer has to match the other half. She is the employer. She's both, okay? And then she's got the M2 she needs to consider. Is she subject to the M2? No, okay. Only if she was married filing separate, she would have just fallen into it, but she's single. Her threshold is 200, so she's not falling into that, okay? So, the employee portion is 9128, the employer portion is 9128. In total, this is 
the 9,128.71. She's going to report the full tax, but she's going to take this other portion as a four AGI deduction. Guys, if I'm pounding on this, get the message, okay? You guys with me? She's employee and employer in this situation. I would still break the taxes in half, and I would still look at them this way, okay? But here, she's self-employed. So she is responsible for paying all of this. But to give her equity with a traditional form of business, they are allowing her then to take this $9,128 of the four AGI deduction, because again, in a true uh, let's say corporate sense, they would be deducting this, okay? That's why they're allowing her then to pull back and deduct this. We good? Okay, here comes the hard one. Okay guys, you may have taxpayers who have traditional employee employer earnings, okay? They work for a company where someone was doing the withholding for them. And maybe they have a side business where they're consulting at nights on the weekend. Or maybe they spent half the year as an employee and then just said, what yeah, the heck with it? I'm going out on my own, starting my own business. Whatever. However it happens, okay, you need to look at all of the combined earnings, okay? Everything has to come into account. Now, for Social Security, guys, the rule says that first you look to their earnings while they were an employee, okay? They're being taxpayer friendly here, because think about it, while you were an employee, you were only responsible for 6.2% of the social security tax, okay? When you're self-employed, you're responsible for all 12.4%. So they're saying, we don't care in what order, you know, you were an employee versus a contractor, okay? Regardless of what order it happened in, you always look at the employee wages first when calculating these taxes, then, if you still need more tax dollars to come out, then you look to the self-employment taxes. They're trying to be taxpayer friendly here. Professor? Yes. Um, just explain that 18 to 57 again. 18. You added that together, or is that? This is just added together. So this is just added together. Um, and it's, again, because she's self-employed, mm -hmm. right, in an employee-employer situation, Jean, she only is gonna have this portion of help from her check. Yeah. She's only responsible for really half the tax plus maybe that. And her employer is gonna match her on the other half. And that's their deduction and their expense. We don't really care what it costs her corporation. It's not her problem, okay? But in this scenario, she's self-employed. She is employee and employer. So she has to pay the full amount of the tax, okay? So I still broke it up as if it was employee, employer. But the fact is, at the end of the day, she's self-employed. And her tax obligation is $18,257. And she has to report that on her return. Okay? But they give her relief because if this was a corporation, they would have allowed the corporation to deduct these expenses. So while she has to report the full amount, they do, in fact, give her a 4 AGI deduction for this portion of the taxes on her return. Okay? This is what we, they were referring to in the beginning of chapter six, where they said you can take the employer portion of the taxes, the payroll taxes, as a 4 AGI deduction. This column is it right here, okay? want to know what his FICA tax obligation is for the year. Okay? 
So we have some self-employment income, we have some employee-based income. How do we kind of go about this? So we have a single taxpayer who is self-employed for the first quarter, who is an employee for the second three quarters of the year. $44,000 of net profit is $178,000 of salary, okay? Guys, we don't want to use this number and nobody in here is gonna use that number, right? You're instantly gonna take that profit and you're gonna multiply it times .9235, okay? Works out to $40,634. That's the number we wanna use for the self-employment earnings. <laughs> okay, now the rule says, we don't care what part of the year he was self-employed, what part of the year he was an employee. We look at these employee wages first, then we only turn and tap into these wages when we need to, okay? So, I'm gonna break them in this order. I'm gonna use his employee wages first, even though he did that for the second part of the year, and we're gonna use his self-employment earnings Second. So, here we go. Social Security, I'm going to break it out the same way. Employee, employer. Okay, guys, we're looking at these first. What's going to be my Social Security tax? 7347, right? I hit the cap. Okay? This would have been withheld. Right, guys, I earned this money while I was employed by Hooligan Corporation, I think it says. Okay, so they would have withheld this from my pay. Okay, they would have done this for me already. So I'm gonna mark this as withheld, okay? They also would have matched me, okay? They would have matched me on that 178. This is their expense, I'm gonna put C for corporation, okay? They matched me. So guys, I don't even need to go and look at these self-employment earnings because I've already met my Social Security obligation up to 118500 when I had them withheld out of these employee earnings. Even though I did it for the second part of the year, the rule says you look to employee earnings first. They're trying to help me out here. I only had an obligation of 6.2% while I was an employee. On this, I have an obligation of 12.4%. So look here first, okay? And it was withheld, so I really don't have to do much more, and the corporation met the other half. So I don't have to tap into my self-employment earnings in this scenario, okay? Now my M1 expense, okay? Guys, we know, no matter what, you're gonna pay the M1 taxes. So not only am I gonna pay them on the 178, I'm also gonna pay them on the 4634. So I've got 2581, on my $178,000 while I was an employee, right? 1.45, and they would have withheld that, guys, right? I earned that $178,000 as an employee, and they would have done the withholding for me on the 1.45. They would have matched it with their own 1.45, and that would have been their expense, okay? Now I do have to tap into these self-employment earnings. Again, this is an unlimited tax. So I do have to tax my self-employment earnings here. So my 1.45 in this case works out to be 589.19. Okay guys, this is on me, okay? This is why I was self-employed. No one withheld or did anything with this. I have to do it on my own. So I'm gonna put a little R next to that because I have to report this. I have to pay and I have to report this. No one's done it for me. And I have to match it on the other side. Okay, I'm gonna put a little R there too. So what's the R for? I have to do the reporting, okay? This money, Jarrett, was while I was an employee on the 178. They withheld it for me, okay? It came out of my pocket, this portion of it, but it was taken out of my paycheck, so I don't have to do accounting for it. Okay, it was part of my FICA tax obligation, but I don't actually have to report it on my tax return. Okay, hopefully you'll see where I'm going by the time I finish. Uh, so I 
dealt with my M1 expense. Now we need to deal with the M2 expense. Now the M2 expense, guys, is a tax that only applies if you reach a certain level, okay? This is a single taxpayer. His level is $200,000. So what I need to do is say, okay, I had 178 while I was an employee. I have another 40,634 self-employed. That gives me 218,634. Okay, my limit, my threshold is 200. So I have an obligation on another $18,634, okay? That's the amount by which my total earnings, my total earnings went over my $200,000 single threshold. So I'm gonna take that 18,634 times the extra 0.9% tax, and that's 167.71. Okay guys, when I was an employee, I didn't reach the $200,000 mark. Okay, so they wouldn't have withheld anything. So this is all on me. I have to report all of this. The employer is not responsible for that extra tax. Okay? You guys with me so far? I'm confused about the, the portion where you're saying the they wouldn't have with, withheld. I, I thought you said they have to withhold up to 200000 After 200000 This last tax, this 0.9% tax, applies only after you reach. So if you are... Once you reach 200000 then they would then Only on the portion over the $200,000. So whatever's under, you still have to do your stuff. This was, well, this would have been here. We dealt with that here. Okay. If it's under $200,000, it's not subject to this tax. This extra tax. If it, so if it was, I'm just kind of confused about what's. Uh, so under two hundred thousand, they're not withholding it for for us on the. Well, it's not that they're not withholding it. It's that they're not. You're not responsible for it, right? If you don't reach two hundred thousand dollars in earnings. Like, let's just say this worked out to 118 in earnings. He wouldn't be subject to this tax at all. Right. Okay. What I was saying here is that, look, the employer, while he was on their books, he didn't reach $200,000 in earnings. So they had no reason. They only have to withhold once he gets to $200,000. He didn't make $200,000 while he was in their employ, so they wouldn't have withheld anything. So instead, I have to take those earnings plus my self-employment earnings combined, my total earnings were 218. I went over my threshold by 18,634. Now, okay, because the employer didn't do anything, I have to do it all, okay? Okay, guys, so we figured out all the taxes, but what does this mean, okay, guys? There could be different questions built in here. You know, the first question is, is what is my FICA tax obligation for the year? What is this taxpayer's FICA tax obligation, okay? Their obligation, guys, is this, okay? That's their obligation. It works out to, if we add it all up, His threshold is 200, you take that off. So he has to pay 
that 0.9% on the extra 18,634. That's where it came from. Okay. And again, that the employer doesn't match that expense. If his um, employee earnings was like over 200000 it would have been reported the same. The number would have just been No, it wouldn't have been the same, okay? It's just that they would have done a little bit of withholding. I would have had to do the rest, okay? Because I would still need to go through this exercise of saying, what's the total number <coughs> minus what they already would have. Um, I might still owe more to it. Uh, I wouldn't make it that complicated. This would be as bad as it's going to get, guys. Um, okay, guys, so look. The total obligation is the money that it's costing him at the end of the day. This was withheld, but it came from his pay. It cost him money, okay? He's gotta go out now and separately pay and report these extra pieces that weren't taken care of for him by an employer. He has to do it on his own. I don't care about these, okay? This isn't part of his obligation because this was the corporation's obligation, not his, okay? So I could ask, what's the FICA obligation, guys? Um, I could ask, what does he have to report, okay? That's where my little R's come in, okay? That would be what he would have to report is his total self-employment taxes on line 57, okay? That would be 1346.09, I'll put line 57. Or, guys, also important is what's his four AGI deduction, okay? What's his four AGI deduction? Can anyone tell me what his 4 AGI deduction would be in this scenario? 589.19, right, this portion, right? He can't get this portion that belongs to the corporation, but he can get this portion because this is the piece that belonged to his self-employment earnings. So it would be 589.19. Guys, if you can get this, this is as bad as it will get. Look, there's a problem in the book, guys, where they've got a husband and a wife and all sorts of earnings. Don't worry about that example, okay? I wouldn't. This, if you can get this, you'll be good. Where's the 1346 on that? 1346 is what he, remember with the little R's? Oh. Okay, those are the little R's because oh. this is the tax that no one was doing for him. No one was, was calculating or withholding for him that he has to go out and report on his own. And it's really coming from Jared, his self-employment earnings um, and the extent that uh, this extra tax is applied. Okay, and then he can get back as a 4 AGI deduction, any employer portion of taxes he reports. Okay? Guys, if you have questions, let me know.